<laughs> okay, welcome. A very good morning to everyone here in the room. Thank you for attending our side event. My name is Pien Metal. I work with the Transnational Institute based in Amsterdam. Um, this side event is sponsored by uh, Intercambios Puerto Rico, uh, who is unfortunately not uh, unable to attend, and the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, who is also unfortunately unable to attend. Um, we did get some uh, contributions from St. Vincent, referring to the very recent developments on cannabis uh, in the country. But we still have a very nice panel here. Um, the name of the event is Caraco Marijuana Commission and Fair Trade Options. We have, in the very last minute, got a, a contribution from a different Caribbean country, the Jamaica, who's also here. So we're very fortunate to hear a little bit about their point of view on this topic. So uh, we will have four contributions. Um, and we will hope to have keep some time for questions uh, and discussion, maybe. So uh, very welcome to all of you. And I would like to give the floor to Rose. Marie-Antoine. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for the organizers, especially and I, for having us here, having me here today. So I'm going to be speaking to you mainly about the CARICOM Regional Commission on Marijuana, which went through a three-year exercise of looking at all of the issues, CARICOM, the Caribbean Community of Nations, um, to see what we will do in terms of the status of marijuana, which, as elsewhere in the world, is illegal. It's an illegal um, substance. And I want to share the key findings, principles, and some of the challenges challenges with you because it is clear that these have universal significance and go beyond the CARICOM region and in particular that they exist within the international sphere. So my point being that it requires a global response. Uh, in our in our exercise, we did do widespread consultations, and the commission itself was a catalyst for change. Once it was launched, Jamaica jumped out first, and you would hear about Jamaica in 2015, modified the law. Then we had, during the process, Belize, Antigua, and Barbuda uh, did some changes as well. Uh, what I would call de facto legalization based on the quantity matrix, so small amounts of cannabis will be legal, and small amounts of growing, five plants, etc. More recently, St. Vincent, after the commission launched its report, uh, passed laws to legalize the medical cannabis industry and provide an amnesty, and several other countries have now said that they would be engaging in law reform. It is not going to be uniform, a uniform kind of law reform, but what they are doing is following what is clearly the desire of Caribbean peoples. We found that there's a groundswell of support for law reform, and it grew very rapidly. For example, in Barbados, 63% in 2017, which just a couple of years before was 30%. And in some countries, as high as 90%, 80%, 90% say that they want law reform in terms of cannabis. So to many of us who've been lobbying for legislative and policy change over the years, the CARICOM experiment seems to be a huge success. The injustices of the current regime have been acknowledged, and we're looking forward to the change. There's almost one voice and a lot of consensus, although we would not see a homogeneous legal framework among the 14 countries. Yet, as the report notes, legislative change on the domestic front can only have real efficacy if there's corresponding policy shift in the formal international treaty instruments and bodies. It is these treaties that have really parented the current criminal-based punitive regime. And this has been slow in coming, and I would suggest even resisted, so that lobbying for the change is an imperative. I don't think this is an attack on a treaty body or the 
treaty itself, but rather an opportunity for genuine reform with, within an objective scientific grounding and within a human rights social equity framework. So currently, while the conventions, Vienna Convention, all the rest, there are exceptions for medical marijuana, as I will demonstrate, such exceptions do not and cannot speak to the myriad of social injustices and more recently the development issues that currently surround the treaty regime and its domestic progeny. So permitting medical marijuana, which of course is vogue, as a legal substance, in my view, is a necessary but not a sufficient first step in the long walk to justice. Incidentally, just to say the distinction between recreational and medicinal mar marijuana is artificial at best. One man's um, recreation is another woman's medicine. A lot of times it's to distress. Uh, more significantly further, the Caribbean has hit upon an unforeseen surprising roadblock with respect to cannabis. I say surprising and unforeseen because for many years, the debate centered around whether to legalize or criminalize. This was the core question. And that, of course, depended on whether to accept the status quo view of cannabis as a harmful, dangerous drug with no value as embodied in international treaties and domestic law the world over. And just as we thought we had satisfactorily addressed this question, uh, a paradigm shift in focus occurred. The buzz today, almost overnight it seems, is the medical marijuana industry. While this on the surface appears to be a positive development, this new phenomenon presents a clear and present danger to the rights and aspirations of ordinary people worldwide, uh, and it can hijack, if you're not careful, the international agenda for law reform and threatens to undermine and even reverse the important gains made in the cannabis debate, if not managed appropriately. And this unhealthy policy approach to medical marijuana presents a dilemma. So we may have won a battle, but I think the war is yet to be won. Ironically, the medical marijuana thrust is speeding up moves to legalize cannabis for medicinal purposes, but slowing down initiatives to legalize or decriminalize in general. Despite the fact that it is a need for social justice that fueled the developments in the first place, and importantly, that Caribbean peoples want this general change. So it's a paradox. So just as we are accepting the Caribbean and other countries, even the international community, that cannabis should not be demonized, this new threat is emerging. So this newfound legitimacy of, legitimacy of cannabis has paved the way for this juncture. In a sense, we are a victim of our own success. How did we get to this point? What are the self-evident truths that caused a shift in the debate moving forward and, and for these calls for legislative change? These are the reasons grounding the change in public opinion. And these are the reasons why it is important, it is vital actually, that the international arena keeps a pace with the domestic front. In the Caribbean, marijuana for most of our history was a free substance grown naturally and easily throughout the region. Many of us have memories of our grandparents and so on using it, bush tea, etc., long before the advent of prohibition. It has deep historical, cultural, and religious significance to our peoples, traced to several ethnic, religious, uh, cultural traditions, and of course through ancient times, known as a substance with healing properties. In the case of of the Rastafarian community, and I'm sure uh, we will hear more from the Jamaicans, it has deep religious sacramental meaning. And we've actually had research on cannabis and some success from way back when because of this link, a cure for glaucoma, for instance. But the current laws that exist in our region and elsewhere were merely responses to international treaty formation, which deemed it a dangerous drug without any value, medicinal or otherwise. Harsh criminal penalties in our region uh, operate within a context of strict liability, no discretion or mitigation is allowed. 
and the evidence um, that the original classification of cannabis is a dangerous drug was made, I think we now accept, without the benefit of scientific research and data. In other words, a legal fiction. And this has now been demonstrably proven to be inaccurate, as we have learned more about its medicinal value, and the fact that it is a lot less harmful than we thought it to be. So there's credible evidence that also the acquisition of the illegal status was due to attempts to stifle competition with alcohol, which are just emerged out of prohibition itself. So the point is that the law lacks a rational basis for its legitimacy to correct a harm or real mischief. So we see it as bad law, and most of our peoples accept this. Also, an inconvenient truth is that prohibition has been ineffective and counterproductive. Despite Despite all of the draconian laws, there's a huge percentage of persons from all strata who still continue to use it. Uh, and despite all of the harsh penalties, so the war on drugs completely discredited, we think education and public health human rights which approach is better. We've also seen since Jamaica and others, Uruguay, have legalized at least some small amounts. We've seen that the bogeyman doesn't exist, so we haven't seen everybody high, let's say, and there's evidence that criminal arrests have decreased. So we've begun to see some benefits as well. And although the commission and the Caribbean accepted that, yes, it's a psychoactive substance with some that needs to be managed, we felt on balance because these health risks are concentrated in high risk persons and specific risk situations that on balance, it was better to regulate, remove prohibition. It was less harmful than other substances when you looked at the scientific evidence. So that a better approach, a more proactive approach, pragmatic public health approach was better. But it was really social equity and social justice questions which we found to be most compelling. These social justice imperatives cannot be ignored, and many of you are familiar with them, but that does not make them any less important. And they're very important as we consider how to approach the international arena. So we see that the laws are discriminatory, they're unjust, they and they violate rights. Uh, so quite apart from the fact that it was based on a false premise, so you're ensuring you are um, handing out harsh penalties when really there's very little basis for the law, no harm as the case may be, and against the rule of law, um, it is also that we have our jails overflowing with otherwise law-abiding citizens, so warehousing and a lot of waste, even 80-something-year-olds have been incarcerated in the region, ineffective. The police themselves and the law enforcement have told us so. Very disproportionate laws when you consider other kinds of offenses. One of the startling examples we have is that in some countries, for example, you can get a non-custodial sentence if you wound with intent and the person dies, but for 1.5 grams of marijuana, you can actually have 40 years um, in jail. So really, if a victim-less crime, very disproportionate sentences, discriminatory, as elsewhere, it's the poor, it's the marginalized, the most vulnerable, and in many contexts, this translates to race, who end up in the jails. And this is not strange to any of the countries. Uh, in fact, um, the issues of even drug use generally, I'm sure we discussed today, it's ready those who, these social issues, in terms of how you address a, a, a regime, really have not at all and cannot be considered by the medical marijuana exceptions or the new thrust towards medical marijuana. Further, we are seeing an emergent human rights jurisprudence based on rights to health and other rights, so that which would mean that the Caribbean, like other countries, could possibly be before the courts if we were to challenge these today, ensure that your rights to grow at least small proportions uh, of, of cannabis would be upheld. The courts in Trinidad, for example, talked about disproportionate penalties as in criminal inhumane punishment. Uh, it is also the case today that because of the status of marijuana, even the profits of the medical marijuana industry would be seen as 
illicit proceeds of crime, money laundering. So all of these issues need to be addressed. And it's really more than merely medical marijuana if we are to address these deep social social wrongs. As calls to modify and change the treaty emerge, it is apparent there's an a twinning of big business concerns as international bodies seek to defend the conventions. So the exceptions for medicinal use, which I mentioned before, are now being spouted as already fulfilling the desired objectives. And that's despite the fact that these exceptions existed in the treaty and domestic law long before we saw the emergence of this big medical marijuana. And it was based on a small license you could get your doctor to import marijuana to treat. So I believe that this new medical marijuana dis discourse is in fact presenting an escape valve for the international treaty regime, allowing treaty bodies to avoid having to address, first of all, the historical accident and error that is the classification of cannabis and dangerous drugs and also to refuse to confront the deep social issues and negative impacts of such a classification. In constructing a more just legislative policy, I suggest restitution and rectification, not merely reparations, should be considered. Farmers have had millions of crops destroyed at great cost based on this legal farce and historical error. In terms of the international ch law challenges, I recognize that there are some fears about the international paradigm. International drug conventions, which perpetuated criminalization of cannabis, have, however, been labeled redundant and dysfunctional even by UN bodies. UNGAS, for example, have talked about this. And since international law and international treaty instruments derive their authority for, from consensus in the international sphere, the fact that so many countries, including Canada, the latest uh, Uruguay, and of many states in the US have already deviated from them. I think this undermines their authority. So it's a fractured system. Certainly there's no moral authority in our dualist system. In fact, theoretically, and of course this is an academic argument, one does not need to um, treat international treaties as, as binding. At the same time, small, vulnerable, developing countries like ours do not have the political clout that others like Canada, who have ignored the treaty, have. They need the certainty of a fair and rational treaty regime to survive. And I remember, and we know what's happening with the offshore tax regime, that's another discussion, but certainly a lot of double standards there. So we recommended that CARICOM member states work together to form to form a regional position and to have a persuasive voice to partnering with the like-minded countries like Canada, to have a regional approach and a clear informed roadmap in order to lobby for change to these treaties, an, an important opportunity for change. Yes, we know the interse as an interim arrangement in the short term, but in the long term, I am convinced that the treaties need to change. Uh, and they contravene human rights principles in Caricom and elsewhere, ignore the social issues. Big business um, interests can no longer be in ignored. I think it's a bit of a deja vu. I'm realizing that this is taking a lot longer than I thought, even though I'm rushing in. But let me try to wrap up. Yes. <laughs> OK. So um, we've seen the big business. It was big business that shaped the international legal framework in the first instance many years ago, the tobacco and the alcohol. And deja vu is once again happening. We need to protect our hegemony, particularly in my part of the world. Uh, we've seen before this, these exploitative power relationships in terms of trade, and we're going to hear more about that. Uh, these are important issues for us. Land tenure and licensing strategies are key for us. Most of the marijuana farmers don't have access to land. They squat on land. So these need to be, uh, these need to be addressed in a, a fair regime. And of course, the emerging trend is for governments to be very much influenced, as well as treaty, treaties themselves influenced by big, big business. So the, Vincent, Vincent, for example, 
um, started off with a wide agenda of reform. And once the company started to come in, they said, okay, let's just do medical marijuana. So a monopoly competition prefer to turn a blind eye to the other socialist industries. I think in the long term, this might also fuel not just violence, but actually a more draconian regime with those who are end up still in the illicit industry, you would find the state having to come in and be harsh with them. We've seen this in Latin America in terms of the extractive industry and indigenous peoples. Uh, so let me stop there and just to say the intellectual property and patent concerns are also important, but I think others will talk about that. So ultimately, we need a much more broad-based approach than simply this narrow uh, focus on medical marijuana and big business, and we need fundamental treaty change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ross. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Um, it's very, it's very significant to have somebody speaking from the CARICOM point of view. There are hardly any countries uh, participating at the CND uh, that are provenient, that are from the Caribbean. Um, and so uh, this is a situation that. We would like to see change because the discussions here are affecting their uh, political situation. And um, we've tried to bring the St. Vincent government here, which unfortunately didn't, we didn't manage to uh, do. But hopefully in the future, there will be more governments coming here to participate in the debates. Jamaica is now the only one that actually has a serious delegation coming here. And uh, I would like to give the floor to Annette now so you can address the issues. <coughs> Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Cannabis Licensing Authority, Jamaica, we want to extend our appreciation to the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Transnational Institute, and the Intercombius Puerto Rico. One, for hosting this side event and for inviting Jamaica and other CARICOM countries to participate. Jamaica, we will explain at this side event the ongoing legislative reforms and the deliberate steps that Jamaica has been taking to involve what we call traditional, and I put small in quotation, grassroots farmers in the emerging licit global cannabis market. Importantly though, I must start by saying that the Cannabis Licensing Authority believes that it is important for the Caribbean to contribute to the debates surrounding cannabis and to share industry developments and policy positions of respective CARICOM countries. So we are indeed grateful that the chair of the commission is here and she spoke before me because she set the context within the region. Attendance at this side event is an excellent opportunity for Caribbean countries since the voice of the Caribbean has been largely absent in Vienna. It is the belief of the authority that this side event will be a catalyst for change to platform if of greater cohesion both regionally and internationally. With that preamble and that context, I must share with you that based on what the chairman of the commission said, yes, there are certain cultural realities in the Caribbean and more so I will share with you in Jamaica. So prior to the amendment to the Dangerous Drug Act in 2015, Jamaica attempted to make changes to the Dangerous Drug Act of 1948. There were several commissions. I can recall the one in 1977, and the one was in 2000. In addition to these commissions, there were many agitations from different groupings. In particular, I will highlight the Rastafari community. Notwithstanding that, and to some extent we're pleased that change, there were changes. So in March of 2015, the government of Jamaica enacted the Dangerous Drug Amendment Act which amended the Dangerous Drug Act of 1948. The amendment of Jamaica's cannabis laws are, um, was driven chiefly by the following concerns. To correct the negative consequences for persons prosecuted 
for possession of small quantities of ganja for personal use. Also to permit sacramental use by the Rastafari and to also facilitate the development of Jamaica's lawful medical, scientific, and therapeutic ganja industry. With those amendments, and I will also include that we went a little further by allowing Jamaicans, each household is allowed to have five plants. With these amendments, persons in possession of two ounces or less of ganja can no longer be arrested, tried, or convicted in court, as this offense no longer carries a criminal record. Instead, persons will be ticketed by the police and may, and may make to pay a fine. This is important for us. We also look at the Criminal Records Rehabilitation of Offenders Act, and that act treat with treat with basically how you deal with the matter of expungement. So it was important for Jamaica to look at what the small farmers and other Jamaicans who had records for small possession of ganja. The CARICOM report, it speaks to many things. And of importance, I will just highlight one. The report speaks to, among other things, having provisions in place to automatically refer children, persons under 18, to counseling and rehabilitation where found in possession of ganja. Jamaica has in place an established government entity, the National Council on Drug Abuse, where those children are automatically referred for counseling and treatment. And the law went further. It also requires the Cannabis Licensing Authority, based on fees that we receive, that a percentage of that fee be sent to the National Council on Drug Abuse for matters treating with public, public education and the vulnerable groups such as, such as children. More so, the law recognizes and permits the authority to contribute to research and development and maintenance of the mental institutions in Jamaica. The Cannabis Licensing Authority came into existence in 2015 with that amendment, and we are responsible for Jamaica's medical regulated framework. So in 2016, the Cannabis Licensing Authority, in conjunction with the Minister of Justice, we, write, we wrote what is known as the Dangerous Drug Cannabis Licensing Authority interim regulations. And they were deliberately set as interim because it is it basically it's a new framework for Jamaica. And we're mindful of our cultural realities. We're mindful of the discussions in international sphere. So we're seeking in the near future to have a regulation or regulations in place that will treat with the realities both locally and internationally. The Cannabis Licensing Authority, based on the regulatory framework, we have two core divisions. We have the Licensing and Applications Division, and we have the Enforcement and Monitoring Division. And the Licensing and Applications Division is basically to receive and process applications in keeping with those regulations while at the same time respecting the framework of the single convention and the other drugs convention. And the enforcement and monitoring division, basically when a license is issued, that um, division is responsible for monitoring and conducting surveillance activities to ensure that the licensees who have received our license permits or authorization, they act in conjunction or in conformity with those requirements. Importantly for Jamaica, we understand the social reality. And if one scrutinized carefully the amendments that were made, it is a clear indication that Jamaicans, the lawmakers, they are fully aware of their social, economic, and the realities internationally and locally. We have put a system in place as best as possible. We call it what is known as Jamaica closed loop system, where licensees can operate with licensees. So we monitor the, the, the ganja that is grown, and we seek to have agreements in place that will best suit licensees and the industry as a whole. But notwithstanding that, though, 
there are some realities. So we're also, it is a medicinal space in respect of the regulated cannabis licensing authorities role. So we're also working with different entities, the Bureau of Standards Jamaica to ensure that the relevant standards and testing requirements are in place so that when the medicine and the ganja is prepared for, for consumption, it can be of the quality. We're mindful that different standards have to be put in place, good agricultural practices, good manufacturing practices, good distribution practices, and good security practices. We're also seeking to put framework in place for hemp because the law and the regulation recognizes the Cannabis Licensing Authority as the body responsible for hemp and ganja. And we're also seeking to put in place regulations for the import and export of ganja and hemp. It is important though, and I will share with you a little bit more, and the chair of the commission spoke to it. There have been persons in the Caribbean, and they will rightly say that over the years, long before this 2015 amendment or the 2016 regulations, they have been encountering and they have gone to prison for small possession of ganja. They will also say, rightly so, that over the years they have been cultivating um, ganja cannabis. So while I comment on the matter of fair trade, I would like to share with you that the Cannabis Licensing Authority is contemplating the development of a category or subcategory of license to facilitate the cultivation of ganja for medical, therapeutic, and scientific purposes by small farmers on lots smaller than one acre. These small farmers will be able to apply for a waiver or deferral of payment of all fees payable under the regulations or the security bond. As licensees, the small farmers will be required to enter into this regulated space. And notwithstanding that intention, I must share with you that the current regulations allow a small farmer who wishes to enter the medicinal space to apply right to the Cannabis Licensing Authority to defer the payment of the security bond, the license fee. They may enter into part payment with us or they may ask us to waive those fees. Importantly though, there are or there is a particular group and over the years they have been cultivating cannabis. So Jamaica is aware that the expansion of the licit uses of cannabis offers opportunities for traditional ganja farmers to transition away from the dependence on the illicit drugs market. It has not escaped the leadership of Jamaica that alternative development, human rights, and fair trade principles are to be recognized and employed to secure a legitimate place for small traditional farmers in the fast-growing legal regulated cannabis market. The 1998 Action Plan adopted by the United Nations General Assembly provides for the inclusion of such an alternative development program through specifically designed rural development measures consistent with sustained national economic development. And it is with that backdrop that I must share with you that Jamaica's alternative development program has been approved by the cabinet in 2016 and is geared towards the transitioning of traditional ganja farmers in the regulated space. One of the primary objectives of the Alternative Development Program is the creation of opportunities for sustainable economic development and eradication of poverty, as well as the protection of traditional farmers through licensing as the industry grows. And I must highlight, and I will want you to share with me today, that we, and the traditional farmers, they are receiving the highest support in Jamaica. And we will share with you a clip from the honorable, the most honorable, Andrew Holness, Prime Minister of Jamaica. We have made a decision to allow for what is called the Alternative Development Program for Ganja. Because it is a real fear that as that industry emerges, to become more corporatized, that the original ganja man, the original farmer, could very well be left out of the gains and the benefits 
when you were the one singing the praises and know the benefits from how long. I made sure to call the Minister of Agriculture and I had a word with him. And he gave me a commitment that within the first quarter of this year, that the alternative development program for the small farmers, the small ganja farmers, to produce for the legal trade, that that will start in the first quarter of this year. And I pick up from there. So the first quarter of this year, I can proudly report here that having the Prime Minister spoken in those words, we are obliged to get the program going. So currently, the Ministry of Industry, Commerce, Agriculture, and Fisheries is leading that project, along with the Cannabis Licensing Authority, who will be providing some support. There are two communities that we have um, identified so far, and one will be in Orange Hill, in the parish of Westmoreland, and the other one will be in the Akongpong village in St. Elizabeth. The one of the challenges that we have encountered, but this alternative development program is assisting it, the matter of tenure with land. So currently we are working with one of the communities to ensure that they receive the right documents to allow them to grow the ganja on that land. So I can say to you that expect more from Jamaica in the near future because come April, not very far from the date given by our Prime Minister, we will be launching the Alternative Development Program. And I close by saying, Vienna is a good space, and Jamaica has decided also, not just being here with a, with a delegation of six, but we intend to be here with other Caribbean countries years to come. And that is why we're seeking a space on the CND for the near future. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Annette, for that. That's an excellent, um, an excellent show of what uh, what the commitment of your government is, and, and a very good wish for the future that we absolutely support. Uh, thank you very much, also, by uh, giving me the opportunity to bridge to the next um, speaker. Uh, the idea to have fair or fairer trade uh, principles caused us to, uh, to develop and crack our heads around what kind of principles and how did you work uh, and led to a publication that we have here. Uh, unfortunately, we've been too enthusiastic uh, <laughs> spreading them around, so we only have a few copies left, but you can, you will be able to find it uh, soon online. Uh, Dave Bully Taylor from the Global Drug Observatory, Swansea University, UK, will give us a brief overview of what this first cannabis innovative product. <coughs> maybe you can introduce. Yes. Sir. Um, uh, will uh, tries to tell you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm really very pleased to have the opportunity to speak on this panel this morning <clears throat> Excuse me, about uh, an important and pressing issue or set of issues that I think are in many ways getting overlooked within the, um, within the current policy debates at national, regional and international levels. And indeed, the, the same way in terms of the speakers has been very kind today because it does lead through from our first presentation to what I want to speak about more specifically in my allotted time. And it's my pleasure, as Pien said, to be launching a new policy report from a new initiative called Cannabis Innovate, as you can see from the PowerPoint here. And this constitutes a partnership between the Global Drug Policy Observatory at Swansea University, um, Equinox International, and some of the activities are being undertaken in collaboration with the Transnational Institute. So the report, item one, uh, fairer trade options for the cannabis market builds upon some of the key findings and messages to come from the, the hugely important report that we've just heard about from the CARICOM Regional Commission on Marijuana. I, I do think it's really important to stress just how thorough, comprehensive and consultative this piece of work is in terms of of research within the region and I would like to commend the whole team and everyone who's involved because it's an excellent piece of work. 
And so um, attempting to emulate, at least in some way, the good practice of the CARICOM report, the Cannabis Innovate report is based on mixed method methodology, um, including research with stakeholders, in workshops in Jamaica, in Colombia, and in Morocco, as well as consultation with fair trade and drug policy experts. Now, the title, Fairer Trade Options for the Cannabis Market, reflects acknowledgement from myself and my co-authors, uh, Sylvia Kay and Martin, who's in the room, Martin Yelsma. It reflects our acknowledgement of the definitional complexity surrounding the term fair trade and lots of other variations thereof. But it also demonstrates our belief in the utility of many of the high order principles developed by what we might call the fair trade movement when we're discussing the rapidly restructuring cannabis market and how, as we've heard, this is impacting small scale cannabis farmers in traditional producer states in what we might call the global south. And so, with that in mind, as, as Peen suggested, what I'd like to do in, in my allotted time is run through just some of the key points of the report to give you a flavour of the content, hopefully encourage you to read it. And if you're not already, just start thinking about some of the issues that we're raising in the report and that you've heard mentioned on the panel thus far. So. Just to add some more context here, as I think we're all aware, policy changes over the past five years or so, maybe even less, have like, dramatically reshaped the global cannabis market, both medical and non-medical. And these changes are agreed in, in many quarters, not all quarters, but many quarters, um, to look set to bring a clear range of benefits in terms of health and human rights. But as we've heard this morning, there are serious concerns and these concerns are growing about the unfolding market dynamics, particularly the activities of many for-profit for cannabis companies, predominantly from the global north, and again, as we've heard, the threatened exclusion of small-scale and marginalised farmers from traditional cannabis producers countries. And despite, <coughs> excuse me, despite some efforts to assist small-scale cannabis farmers to transition out of illegality. So this is really what we're focused on, it's this transitioning process. Despite some efforts to assist here, many barriers still exist to entering the market for these communities. And so with this in mind, we argue in the report for what we call a fairer trade cannabis model. And this is built around a rights-based, inclusive, and environmentally sustainable approach to market engagement and we hope it offers a promising way forward and hopefully a way within which we can frame the debates and actually frame market structures. And indeed, uh, we think that carefully designed regulatory frameworks would allow small-scale farmers to work in mutually beneficial partnership or alongside large companies. But moreover, these could also contribute to achieving the UN's sustainable development goals in those parts of the world where ending poverty remains a pressing concern and to the fulfilment of the promise to leave no one behind. It's a phrase that we've heard quite a lot in a few different contexts over the course of the week here at the CND. So with that in mind, it probably comes as no surprise that we argue that the development of a fairer trade cannabis market requires a different approach to that being predominantly deployed and the consideration of a range of interconnected frameworks relating to stages within the commodity chain. So within the report, we organise these frameworks so these frameworks, as I said, are just designed to help better understand the situation and focus our minds in terms of what we need to think about. So as you can see here, we organise them in terms of producer, quality and standards, uh, consumer, end user and market finance and trade policy. So I won't go through them all now because we haven't got the time, but, um, there's, excuse me, but there are key, key issues that we need to, to um, consider. And I think 
Empowering producers through inclusive business models is really important. Um, quality and standards, this was mentioned earlier in terms of good manufacturing practices and good agricultural practices. Issues to do with consumer and end use and end users. This notion, you know, is there a demand for something called fairer trade cannabis? How can political consumerism drive these changes? What are the opportunities and challenges? And then finally, again, some of the issues that we've already spoken about, market finance and trade, avoiding what we might want to call the big cannabis complex and ensure that there's well-functioning supply chains and so on. So as you see, each of these frameworks contains specific themes for consideration. It's important to stress, however, and again, I just want to echo this, that these are just initial considerations rather than anything definitive. It's likely that other issues will come to play as we learn more about the market and as the market develops. And clearly, and deliberately on our part, uh, these frameworks are quite operational or applied in nature, because we've got to remember these things are happening now, so we need to start thinking about what we can actually do on the ground. And they draw, and again deliberately, and I, I, I alluded uh, to this at the beginning in terms of the research methodology, on experience from other commodity sectors. Because if we're just looking at cannabis as a commodity now in many respects, we need to draw on lessons learned good and bad practices in other commodity sectors. And also we're drawing on examples from the Global South and as well as issues in, in the Global North. Things that are taking place within, within the US and to a lesser extent because of the time scale within Canada. So that said, um, in order to help frame the, the broader debate and the associated nature of market engagement by a range of actors, we also offer up uh, a more generalised, overarching uh, conceptual structure. And so we believe that while the rapidly expanding legal cannabis market and the associated political, legislative and commercial landscape remains very complex, it's hugely fluid and dynamic, it's still possible to develop a set of guiding principles upon which this fairer trade cannabis model can be built. So again, just running through these, these quickly, mindful, mindful of time, we think it's important to demonstrate a commitment to solidarity and social justice. So here we're talking about integrating ethical concerns as a foundational part of this transitional process, including granting pre preferential access to small farmers, as is happening in, in Jamaica and other parts of the world to a lesser extent perhaps. Um, and also, I think it's really important um, the expungement of their criminal records, and this is this is something that's, that's taking place in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I'm um, centering on producer empowerment and community benefit sharing through more equitable terms of trade. And it's really important that the producers aren't seen as just providers of more of raw materials. There's got there's got to be systems and frameworks in place where they they are value creators. They don't lose out on the additionality of these commodity chains and processes. It's important in terms of strong environmental and sustainability standards. We look at energy, water and agricultural inputs. I think just at this point I'd just like to mention water in places like Morocco. There's huge issues in the Rif with some of the strong THC strains that have been um, grown currently for the illicit market within Europe being very thirsty and huge environmental issues in terms of water within the region. Uh, labour protections, democratic control and participation within the decision-making processes of these structures, transparency and traceability, um, and focusing on, on longer-term strategies. Two of my slides have jumped together there, but they're supposed to be separate. But I think as well it's important that it's not just immediatist and short-term thinking. You've got, to, you've got to start thinking about the longer story and the longer processes. And then finally, some resonance with so social history of areas where cannabis is being, being produced. You know, foregrounding uh, traditional growing communities, the role of cannabis and their cultural, religious identities and practices. And I think further down the line, and there's some discussion now around geographical indications and the Appalachian model being applied to cannabis um, as the market develops. Again, it's really important to highlight at this point that these are non-hierarchical and they're certainly not exhaustive. We would hope that these would develop and be more refined over time. 
And we see this project and the report very much as an initial foray into what is a complex topic. And we'll hope, as I suggested at the beginning, that, that they will stimulate further debate, further reflection, and indeed research, because we need to develop a research agenda about these in terms of indicators and to see what's happening as the licit cannabis market evolves. Although, again, it's important to stress that there, need, there will need to be um, cultural sensitivity and flexibility based upon the diversity of profiles of growers and consumers, indeed, in different regions. But above all, though, the guiding principles and the report ultimately is a call now here at the CND and elsewhere, hopefully at the regional level, as well as the national level. It's a call to policymakers. It's a call to development agencies. It's a call to investors to start taking the issue of fairer trade cannabis seriously and to help transform the idea from a utopia from a utopia to a reality. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dave, for this short uh, um, we can is it already online? Do we yes, have the paper? Actually online? if we can go to the final slide. Oh sorry, this is... can we go back? <laughs> sorry. The last uh, PowerPoint. The last slide. Yeah, so, oops. If you'd like to, as, as Pien said, there's some, some reports that are available so hard, but the, the report is online. If you just click, you can download the PDF, so please do. Yeah. Do visit and read. We also have the intention to uh, translate it into at least one other language, which is Spanish, yeah. for those of you <laughs> present. Okay, um, thank you very much. We have five more minutes, six more minutes left. I'm really um, sorry that we don't have any time because I want to read out uh, a statement that we received from uh, a, an organization from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Mm -hmm. Can you put uh, at least the image of the person who wrote <laughs> this, um, this statement? Um, Junior uh, Spirit is, is somebody we have been working for for at least 10 years. He's uh, a representative of uh, the St. Vincent uh, Cannabis Revival Committee and currently uh, involved in the development of the new regulation model that St. Vincent government has decided upon. I will read out his statement so there's something in the room from St. Vincent as well. I. <clears throat> A very pleasant good day to all the participants of this CARICOM Marijuana Commission side event at the 62nd session of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs. Today I am very honored to be given the opportunity to address you on behalf of our traditional, traditional growers of cannabis and as president of the SVG Cannabis Revival Committee, the representative organization of our growers. Just over three months ago, our parliament passed two very important and historic pieces of legislation, the Medical Cannabis and the Amnesty Acts. Prior to then, there were a series of consultations throughout the country led by the Ministry of Agriculture on the issue, with the participation of the CRC members, members of the Rastafarian community, elected members and other representatives of the official opposition and the wider community. The Rastafarian community of whom special mention must be made, if only because their historically distinguished role in the struggle for cannabis reform and to whom cannabis is sacred, have by their protests played a significant role bringing us to this juncture. Unfortunate, though, this development came at a time when, for reasons better explained by the Rastas, their movement faced serious fragmentation. This affected the broader unity which earlier characterized our struggles for cannabis reforms, co compounded by insufficient sensitization on the issue, attempts aimed at partisan political divides, and an attitude as if the debate was concreted in stone. 
But the CRC remained focused, guided by the recognition that traditional growers were the ones who bore the brunt of this illegality. And they did so because they lacked alternative employment. The CRC placed the interest of the growers at the head of our agenda. Many growers were doubtful when the government first announced that it was going to establish a medical cannabis industry. Many still are, though this is increasingly reducing. Our participation at the parliamentary select committee level, which included for most part actual growers, helped in reducing such doubts. Our continued defense on behalf of the growers in the face of lies and propaganda aimed at undermining the process and against attempts by some unscrupulous investors and their agents to force growers into accepting a paltry of 50 US per pound for their cannabis has increased the confidence of more growers in the industry. The CRC has been able to successfully negotiate the return of farm tools and equipment seized by the police from growers whose farms were eradicated following the passage of the Amnesty Act. And at the time, at the time when growers were preparing to comply with the amnesty. Now, I can say with some confidence that the vast majority of our growers are becoming less doubtful. Traditional cultivators are looking forward to actively participate in the new industry. Traditional cultivators are eagerly looking forward to be able to take care of their families within the framework of the law. To stop engaging in risky ventures, which makes them potential victims of armed pirates who rob them of their produce and who often kill their loved ones in the process to be no longer depending on unscrupulous metal men and women who credit their produce never to return. That has been the life of our traditional growers. A modern medical cannabis industry is projected to reduce the deforestation of our mountains in our mountains where cannabis is grown extensively and which affects our water supply. A modern medical cannabis industry is projected to reduce our crime rates and the flow of illegal guns, largely associated with the illegal drug trade. A medical cannabis industry is projected to provide alternative and sustainable economic development for traditional growers. Like everyone else, our growers want to live in peace and to enjoy sustainable economic lives, which they believe that a modern medical industry, if properly, if properly navigated, has the potential for offering. Finally, the CRC does not only speak for traditional growers, but we also echo the sentiments of our brothers and sisters, particularly those in the cities who historically have been our natural allies by the purchasing of our cannabis and the retailing in it on the recreational markets. Hence, our call for decriminalization reforms forms part of our overall call for cannabis reform. We will not remain silent while our people, particularly our youth, continue to be criminalized for the simple possession of cannabis. We will continue to call for change and we will use the victory on the medical cannabis front as a springboard to deepen the process for cannabis reform, keeping the best interest of our traditional growers in mind until full legalization is achieved. I thank you. It is exactly 10 o'clock. <laughs> I'm very sorry, but I think we have to close the session. I thank you very much all for your attention, especially Rosemary, who's traveled so far to be with us. Uh, please take a report. There's, there's still a few of them outside. Uh, and let's see if next year we can continue the discussions. Okay. Thank you.